В рамках уголовного дела о крушении самолета в Тверской области завершено проведение молекулярно-генетических экспертиз. По их результатам личности всех десяти погибших установлены. Они соответствуют списку, заявленному в полетном листе. And let's start things off with an update on the Trump mugshots. So how much money did Trump make from the mugshot? Well, the latest reports are that Trump raised a whopping 7.1 million since his mugshot was released by the Fulton, by the Fulton County Jail. 7.1 million that's in uh, fundraising and merch and stuff like that <laughs> that's a lot of money man that is a lot of money to make in in what uh, two days one and a half two days <laughs> completely expected this is no surprise I actually think the number is a little low <laughs> i was expecting like 10 or 15 million but give it another week By next week, he would have raised around 15 million or something like that <laughs> from a mugshot photo. Unbelievable. What a what a fail from uh, from the Democrats and the deep state, the Biden White House. What a complete and utter fail this was. They gave Trump the best marketing material the best marketing narrative uh, a presidential candidate could hope for could dream of anyway <laughs> let's uh let's now talk about biden and some of biden's alleged corruption because we have a fox news interview with the then ukraine prosecutor mr shokin And this is the first time that Shokin has actually, Victor Shokin, has actually spoken out about Biden and Hunter Biden and Burisma and his firing since, I believe, 2019. Victor Shokin actually went to a court in Vienna and uh, I think he... He... Uh, He sued Biden or he, he tried to press charges against Biden or something like that. And this was like back in like 2018, 19. But he's been silent for like, uh, well, for three, four years. And uh, outside of that court document, he hasn't really spoken out much about what went down in, uh, in Ukraine. But Fox News... They got him to speak. I wonder how they did it. <laughs> I wonder how Fox News snagged an interview with Victor Shokin. So what did Victor Shokin say? Well, he said that Biden is corrupt and that Hunter Biden is corrupt and that uh, they made money out of Ukraine. <laughs> I'm shocked. I am shocked. Basically, Victor Shokin was like, look, they fired me because I was investigating Burisma and uh, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden. Their, uh, their job in Ukraine was to protect Burisma and Burisma's founder and managing director, uh, Zlochevsky. And from what I understand, check this out. This is coming from Zero Hedge. Zlochevsky was, at one point in time, he was Ukraine's Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources. And uh, he actually, when he was Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources, Lachesky, who owned Burisma and had, and had Hunter on the board of Burisma, granted his own company permits to drill for oil and gas in Ukraine. <laughs> Lachesky, who was hired, who hired Hunter Biden to sit on his board granted his own company, Burisma, permits to drill for oil and gas in Ukraine while he was Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources, Shokin stated in a 2019 deposition that there were five criminal cases against Lachevsky, including money laundering, corruption, illegal funds, transfers, and profiteering 
through shell corporations while he was a sitting minister. <laughs> EU values, Ukraine democracy, EU values. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's see. Shokin said the fact that Joe Biden gave away $1 billion in exchange for my dismissal, my firing. Is that alone a case of corruption? <laughs> we also have Biden on video, by the way, <laughs> saying that he uh, he gave uh, Ukraine a billion dollars to fire Shokin. So there's, there's the video as well, but you know, <laughs> forget about the video. <laughs> That's not evidence. That's not proof of corruption. Biden telling the Atlantic Council or whatever think tank event he was attending that if uh, Poroshenko would not fire the, the prosecutor, then he wouldn't get a billion dollars in aid. No, that's not quid pro quo uh, corruption, is it? No, <laughs> that's perfectly normal. That's perfectly legit. <laughs> so the White House, they came out with a statement by their spokesperson, Ian Sams. He dismissed Shokin's claims saying that uh chiding fox news for giving a platform for these lies to a former ukrainian prosecutor general whose office his own deputy called a hotbed of corruption right so the biden white house is going to say that victor shokin was corrupt victor shokin is saying that biden is corrupt biden's on video saying that he withheld a billion dollars in aid unless shokin was fired <laughs> Obama, he appointed Biden as the de facto ruler of, of Kiev, of Ukraine, when the White House and Victoria Nuland initiated the, the 2014 Maidan coup. They appointed Biden to, to run the country, and his son ended up on the board of Burisma, making $80,000 a month. And uh, Zlochevsky, who was the minister of ecology and and uh, whatever, <laughs> the Minister of Ecology and whatever, he, uh, he gave Burisma, his own company, a license to, to drill for oil and gas. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong going on here. No, no funny business going on here. I wonder, I wonder in what region Burisma was going to drill for oil and gas. I would bet, I would bet that Burisma was going to drill for oil and gas, and the license for drilling was in the east of Ukraine, in Donbass. Just a hunch. <laughs> Just an educated guess. And now we may know why all of this conflict was started. Because of oil and gas. That's my, that's my guess. So, yeah. That's... Uh, that's the story on Shokin. Medvedev, he gave an interview to RT and TASS News Agency, and he told RT and TASS News that, uh, that Obama, he sent uh, Biden to Ukraine in order to, to collect the money. <laughs> that was pretty much what Biden's task was. And then Biden appointed his, his son, who's, who's not very bright, according to Medvedev, and uh, their their whole task in Ukraine was just to extract resources from from the country. That was pretty much their their goal in Ukraine. That was what Biden sent. Uh, that was what Obama sent Biden to do. That's why he was appointed the de facto ruler of uh, of Ukraine. Hunter was sent to Ukraine to earn money, according to Medvedev. And Medvedev said in the interview that uh, that we need to be frank and uh bluntly honest biden is not not a very bright person nor is hunter biden and they were just pretty much uh bag men i guess is the term that you would use is that the correct term they were bag men they were just there to collect the funds and boy do they collect a lot of money a whole lot of money for everybody in dc that's my guess my guess is that biden was the point guy and he appointed his dopey son and uh, they were just there to, to extract all the resources from uh, Ukraine. And if I had to take a guess, 
I would say that a whole bunch of people in uh, DC were, were just cleaning house from uh, Biden's work in Ukraine, father and son. And that's why they love Biden. That's why they protect Biden. That's why the entire US government is so pro-Ukraine war. That's why they're so upset with Putin. Because Putin came in and he ruined their, their business, right? This was easy money. American citizens had no idea what was going on. This was unaudited, unaccounted for funds. And, you know, they were making billions and billions every year from their business dealings in Ukraine. And then Putin comes in and he ruins the game. Of course, they're going to be pissed off, <laughs> right? They're probably upset not only with Russia, they're probably upset with Ukraine as well, which is why they're, they're destroying the country. That's, uh, that's what Medvedev said in this interview, kind of confirming much of what Shokin said in his interview with Fox News. And none of this is a big surprise. None of this is, 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 is news or shocking or anything like that. I think we all understand what was going on in Ukraine and what Biden was up to in Ukraine. So the Hungarian foreign minister, Peter Siarto, he was uh, giving a speech and he said that everyone is laughing at the European Union because of the sanctions. Let me get you his exact words. He said that Europe is destroying itself in the name of supporting Ukraine and that the EU's sanctions policy is a laughing stock on the global stage. That is what the Hungarian foreign minister said. He also said that his country's position on the conflict has not changed and the conflict in Ukraine must end this minute. It would be a Baroque and poetic exaggeration to say that sanctions against Russia have succeeded in crippling the Russian economy. See, after told attendees at the Transit Political Festival on Saturday. The policy of sanctions has failed, he said, adding that everywhere in the world, the European sanctions policy is being laughed at. Yeah, he's right about that one. Everyone in the world outside of the European Union and the collective West, they are indeed laughing at the sanctions policy. What number are we on uh, by now? We're on sanctions package 12. Is that where we are? <laughs> 12 sanctions packages. And, uh, and how are those sanctions packages working? Working out for the EU? Not so good. Well, they're working out well for, for Kaya Kalis and her husband. <laughs> they're making money from the sanctions. The, uh, the Juan Guaido of Belarus, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, she, uh, she's upset with the European Union because she wants the EU to place more sanctions on her country, Belarus. This is, this is a person who wanted to be the president of Belarus and then Lukashenko beat her in an election and he did beat her in an election. He did win. Whatever funny business took place, Lukashenko did uh, come out ahead over Tikhanovskaya. She's still bitter about that. But uh, she then went into exile because she tried to overthrow the elected government of Lukashenko, along with the help of the European Union. And her coup attempt failed. And then she went into exile in like Lithuania, Latvia or Poland, wherever she's at right now. And She's trying to, uh, to get the European Union to place more sanctions on Belarus. And she's upset because she claims that EU companies are bypassing EU sanctions by exporting wood out of Belarus. Former Belarusian presidential candidate Svetlana Tikhanovskaya has accused her European supporters of hypocrisy after an investigation revealed that EU companies were bypassing Brussels sanctions and importing wood from Belarus. Despite an embargo, 
An investigation by Belarusian opposition groups last December found that companies in Poland and Lithuania switched to importing wood from Belarus via Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan while paying suppliers in Belarus directly. Tikhanovskaya wants these loopholes to be closed. In an interview with The Guardian this week, she declared that sometimes one has to decide whether you want to support democracy or do business, adding that, yes, the money will be tight, but democracy is everyone's responsibility. So the, the person that wanted to be president of Belarus and lost, and lost the election, she now wants the European Union to sanction Belarus harder. <laughs> sanction Belarus harder. Because the European Union, there are countries that are bypassing the sanctions, big surprise there, and they're importing wood from Belarus. And they're making money. And she's upset about that. For Tikhanovskaya, it's better to, to punish Belarus and, and have the Belarusian people suffer in the name of democracy. <laughs> That's what she says, in the name of democracy. It's all in the name of democracy. But yet she can't admit that she lost an election. And she did lose the election. <laughs> the Juan Guaido of Belarus. So that is, uh, that is the news from Belarus. And let's see here, I'm kind of winging it today. I'm winging it this morning. The Telegraph, they uh, had an article that they put out the other day and the Telegraph claims that the Ukraine military, they have broken through Russia's first line of defense. And now they're making a quick dash to the city of Tokmak. Had to bypass the tourists, <laughs> walk past the tourist group. So yeah, Telegraph is saying that uh, the big counteroffensive is finally working. Ukraine offensive to speed up as Russian forces break through Russia's strongest line of defense. Kiev's troops are poised to capture the village of Rabotina in the southern sector of the front line, a victory that commanders say can unlock Russia's formidable defenses. It's over. It is over. They have unlocked Russia's defenses and now they're going to make their way towards Tokmak and then towards Belitopol and then towards the Sea of Azov and it's game over according to the Telegraph. Rabatino is actually in the uh, the gray zone, the security zone, and the latest reports that I have read are that uh, there is still fierce fighting taking place at Rabatino, even though the Russian forces, from what I, from what I understand, are, uh, are, out, are, are outnumbered in a big way because the Ukraine military, they have sent everything they have in the direction of Rabatino to try and break through because they only have something like four or six weeks left to try and show some sort of progress. And they have to get through Rabatino, not in order to break through the first line of defense like the Telegraph is claiming, but in order to begin to move towards Russia's first line of defense, which is where the real fighting begins. It's the Telegraph, they're making it seem like this is where the, the hardest part of the big counteroffensive is taking place. That's a lie. That is a lie, and the Telegraph knows it. This is the easy part. Trying to break through the gray zone, the security zone, this is the easy part of the big counteroffensive. If Ukraine manages to to capture Rabatino, then they can make their way towards the first line of defense. And that's where the real difficulties begin. But the Telegraph is trying to paint the picture where Ukraine has broken through and now they're making a mad dash towards Tokmak, which is just not the case. Anyway, that is the Telegraph pushing out 
propaganda because they want to keep the UK citizen invested in the conflict. Just another six months and Ukraine's going to flatten the curve. Everybody in the UK, keep on sending your money to the Alensky regime because in six months, Ukraine is going to flatten the curve. In one year, Alensky is going to flatten the curve. <laughs> They're going to make it to, to Melita Pol. Just give it another year. Keep on sending your money to Alensky. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. They're going to flatten the curve. So there's, a, there's an admission from Alensky's BFF, Mr. Podoliak, that Zeluzhny met with NATO generals and NATO commands a couple of weeks ago, close to the Ukraine-Polish border, which is code speak for Zeluzhny met with NATO command in Poland. Whenever this, they say Ukraine-Polish border, they mean that's Zeluzhny. If, if he is the real Zeluzhny, he traveled to Poland and they met with uh, NATO command. And according to these statements, Zeluzhny was given the orders from NATO to change up tactics, to change up the approach for the big counter-offensive. And that is what Zeluzhny has done. I talked about this in a video a couple of days ago that Zeluzhny was told by NATO to stop with all the nonsense in Bakhmut and to take all of the resources that have been provided to Ukraine and throw them all in the direction of Rabatino. And that is what we are seeing. So just confirmation that Zeluzhny, if it is the real Zeluzhny, the Harry Houdini of generals, the great disappearing Zeluzhny, confirmation that he traveled to Poland, met with NATO command, got the orders from NATO to stop fighting a two or three front uh, conflict in Bakhmut and to take everything that NATO has provided to Ukraine and throw it all in the direction of Rapatino and to stop being casualty averse. I'm sure that the NATO command told Zeluzhny to stop being casualty averse. And you've got six weeks, Zeluzhny, so you better deliver results. That's what NATO commanders told Zeluzhny. And that is what we are seeing playing out right now at the moment in Rabatino. Let me say this. If Ukraine does not break through Rabatino, I think they'll probably take this, this village. But if they don't, and this these Russian forces, which are outnumbered, if they defeat the full force of the Ukraine military in Rabatino with the famous Russian washing machines and shovels, then uh, then they're going to drop uh, Alensky. The collective West is going to be furious. NATO is going to be furious and they're going to drop Alensky. <laughs> they're going to be they're, they're going to be rid of him. No doubt about it. Or they'll drop Zeluzhny. They're going to have to pin the blame on blame on someone. Alensky is going to try and blame Zeluzhny. Zeluzhny doesn't talk much, doesn't appear much on uh, on video, so he'll probably uh, he'll probably take the fall for all of this once again if he if he even exists at this point in time. I think that's the beauty of having a, a Harry Houdini general is you can pin the blame on the failed counteroffensive on him, and he doesn't really have much to uh, to say, does he? He's not really going to come out and defend himself, is he, Zeluzhny? So that's pretty convenient for Alensky to have a general like that. And of course, NATO is not fighting in this war. They're not involved in this war. They have nothing to do in this, with this war. But, you know, they're, they're meeting with, with the top uh, command of Ukraine and they're planning out the, the last remaining strategy, the last remaining tactics in this uh, big counteroffensive. Not to the benefit of Ukraine. Everything that's being done right now in Rabatino is not, it doesn't serve a military purpose. It's not for the benefit of Ukraine. This is a political decision that the NATO generals are dictating to Zeluzhny. Politics is demanding that Ukraine manages to, to capture something of significance. The politicians demand it. And so that's what we're seeing uh, playing out right now in Rabatino. Should I do a clown world? 
have I finished going over the top stories of the day? Speaking of Zaluzhny, Spiegel, let's walk, let's walk a little bit more on Singuru Avenue. Speaking of Zaluzhny, Spiegel, Spiegel, the German publication, they did, uh, they did some more investigative journalism in and around Nord Stream, the Nord Stream sabotage. And uh, they said that all roads lead to Kiev. Nord Stream attack. The traces lead in one direction, to Ukraine. It's a pretty long article from uh, the German mainstream media outlets, but basically they say that even though they don't have 100% certainty as to who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline and who did this to Germany, who attacked Germany, they said that after, after months and months and hundreds of hours of investigation, there could only be one, uh, one culprit. There could only be one country to blame for the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage and that country is Ukraine and then Der Spiegel asks the question if it is indeed Ukraine and they say that all the evidence that they've seen pretty much points in one direction and that is Kiev they say then uh, what does Germany do what should Germany do what should NATO do knowing that Ukraine attacked German infrastructure and blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, what does Germany do? What does the United States do? What does NATO do? That is the question that uh, Der Spiegel is asking. Are you telling me they're not going to drop uh, Alensky or they're not going to, to make Zaluzhny a big time fall guy for everything? Something is cooking for Der Spiegel to come out with this article. My thinking is that they're going to blame Zaluzhny for the big counteroffensive failure, they're going to blame Zaluzhny for Nord Stream and they're going to wrap it all up and say uh, Zaluzhny's at fault. And then they're going to hold it over Zelensky's head. They're going to hold it over Zelensky's head and they're going to probably say, you see, Zelensky, what we did to Zaluzhny? This is what we're going to do to you if you don't uh, do as we tell you, whatever that means. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. But they're going to do something like that. They're going to do something like that. Because for Der Spiegel to come out with this article while uh, the big counteroffensive is failing and they're asking the questions of uh, what Germany should do in order to deal with what could have been a possible Ukraine attack on, uh, on Germany, something is cooking. Something is cooking. So let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. Let me cross, actually. Let me cross here. And then we'll get to our clown world. So before we do a clown world, how about a video of uh, Tucker Carlson speaking to a crowd in Hungary where Tucker Carlson said the world is realigning at high speed and turning against the United States. But the Biden administration is spending its time harassing one of our last sincere allies in Europe, Hungary, for the crime of being too Christian. And I think that Tucker has published or he will publish his latest uh, episode on Tucker for Tucker for Twitter or Tucker for X. I don't know what his show is called now that uh, Twitter has changed its name to X. But uh, he interviewed Viktor Orban, and I believe that that interview is either on his Twitter profile or is going to be published on his Twitter profile. So wanted to get that news out there. And let's do a quick clown world. How about this from the AI robot known as Budanov, the head of Ukrainian intelligence? Quote, Putin has nothing more then a human resource. There is no economy, no military industrial complex. Military reserves are exhausted. <laughs> That's a quote from Ukraine's Intel 
Android artificial intelligence chief. Putin has nothing. There is no economy, no military industrial complex, no military, nothing. It's all exhausted. And they're removing chips from washing machines to power up fighter jets and to make drones. <laughs> Their economy is in tatters. It's in tatters and we have to we have to repeat these narratives because there's a Hollywood writer's strike and we just don't have new narratives. So that is pretty much what is going on. That's why we're hearing all of this this stuff rehashed again from a year ago. Washing chip, washing machine chips and Russia's economy is in tatters and Russia is exhausted and there is no more, uh, there are no more resources and Russia is just uh, a gas station masquerading as a country. The riders are on strike. So <laughs> what can, what can Budanov and Annalena Baerbach and, uh, and Ursula, what can they do when their script riders are, are on strike? So that was a statement from Budanov. And finally, we'll wrap up this clown world with a Bloomberg interview of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And I have no idea what this is, by the way. <laughs> but uh, Justin Trudeau, he spoke with Bloomberg. The title of Bloomberg's post interview with the Canadian Prime Minister is G7 will support Ukraine for as long as it takes, Trudeau says. Canada's NORAD role unlikely to change if U.S. Republicans win. Canada has no plan to add nuclear-powered submarines to its fleets. And Trudeau said that, and I quote, we always knew that the counteroffensive of the armed forces of Ukraine would be long. We are ready for a war that will take as long as it takes because we cannot and must not allow Russia to win, the Canadian Prime Minister said, for as long as it takes. Another narrative script prepared for the Collective West leadership, courtesy of the Hollywood scriptwriters who are now on strike. For as long as it takes, Canada will fight Russia, will support Ukraine for as long as it takes, according to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Even if the Republicans win the White House, even if Trump becomes president, Canada will continue to support Ukraine. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. That's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> we always knew that the counteroffensive of the armed forces of Ukraine would be long, according to Justin Trudeau, which is a lie. It is a lie. The collective West, the Oletsky regime, the Ukraine military, the collective West media, they were telling us for six months that Ukraine would reach the Sea of Azov in three to five days. The Russian military would retreat at the first sight of the Ukraine military advancing, and it would be that easy. It would be game over. That's what they were telling us for six months. And then the counteroffensive happened, and, well, we know the rest. We know what's going on right now. So let's see what this is, and we'll wrap up this video. So Trudeau is lying. He's repeating the the new the new narrative that they prepared, which is that uh, they knew this this counteroffensive was going to take a long time. They they can come up with those narratives without the the need of Hollywood scriptwriters. That's that's an easy one to to put together. We knew all along that, that the counteroffensive was going was to take a really, really, really long time. We never said that it was going to take three to five days. We never said that, that Ukraine would reach the Sea of Azov in a week. We never said any of that. We've been saying all along now that the counteroffensive was going to be a slow, slow process. <laughs> that is what Trudeau wants all the people of Canada to believe. Because, you know, the one thing that the collective West leadership understands is that uh, people have, have a, short, a short memory. They, they forget. They forget that for six months, the narrative was a quick lightning strike to the Sea of Azov. Five days. It was going to be fast and easy. An easy defeat of the Russian military because the Russian military 
always retreats according to the collective West narrative. And they understand that people will forget what they were telling us just, uh, just three months ago. And so they've, they've changed up the, the narrative. And now it's, you know, it's always go it was always going to be a long process, the counteroffensive. Anyway, that's the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. Which way should I go? I don't even know why I went up that way. Let's go down this way. <laughs> the Duran.locals.com. We are on Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rumble, and Rockfin. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code Good Day. It's the Burger Fest coming up the 21st to 24th of September and the 28th to the 1st of October. Come to Greece, let's grab a burger. If you don't want to grab a burger, then come to Greece and you can see the Fire Wind concert on the 3rd of September. Grab your ticket. Oh, David, David Getza. Wow. On the 27th of August. That's today. Okay. Wow. Uh, Steve Angelo. On the 26th of August. That was yesterday. Take care.